My rebuttal of Mike Winger's arguments against limited atonement. This video is going to consist of three parts, although I will publish them as one, but I may publish each individual part as well just to make it easier. Part one is going to be a positive case for limited atonement. Part two is going to be looking at the difficult passages that people often raise against limited atonement. And part three is going to be where I review Mike Winger's particular objections. Now, I believe the best way to deal with this, if you're listening, is to go through each one at a time. So when you get to my section where I deal with Mike Winger's objections, many of his objections will have actually been dealt with in great detail in my positive case for limited atonement. But the reason why I'm doing it this way is because I want scripture to be the one that speaks. And because one of the major arguments that Mike Winger raised was that he believes that Calvinists use philosophical arguments to, or systematic theology arguments in order to trump specific biblical passages that he thinks are clearly in the favor of the universal atonement view. No, and I'm not, that, that's not to be mistaken with universalism. We'll get into all of that. This is the introduction part to, or part one of my rebuttal of Mike Winger's arguments concerning limited atonement. So as we stated in the introduction, we, this is going to be done in three parts. Part one will be a positive case for a limited atonement. Part two will be working through the difficult passages that people use to refute um, limited atonement. And part three will look at Mike Winger's objections particularly. But I believe if you persist with all the series of one, two, and three, you will actually get most of his objections already answered in the Bible passages that I will quote. And my particular interest in this video is not to use any arguments that, whilst I believe they are true arguments, that they are often used as an argument, as a general idea to say that the idea of limited atonement that Calvinists put forward is only arguable through philosophical arguments that are supposedly then stated about them that they trump biblical passages. And I don't think that is a true reflection of the Calvinist position. And that I think humbly said just um, demonstrates that there's a lot of misunderstanding. And, you know, I think even as Mike himself in his video stated that people just simply talk past each other. So let's get into my rebuttal and part one is going to be a positive case for what I would like to call particular redemption and we'll see why I use this term as we dig into the subject matter. So part one as I said is a positive case for particular redemption and the positive case for particular redemption is um, it's why I believe the story of the redemption in the Bible is particular. I don't like, as I said, the word limited since it raises negative connotations. So I'm not a universalist, nor is Mike. So I'm going to use the term universal atonement, not to say universalism, but just so I can juxtapose the idea of limited atonement against the universal idea. When I use that term, please don't misconstrue me saying universalism. Neither of us in this argument believe in that proposition. These then can be set aside opposite terms as in inde indefinite and universal. As in, you know, the particular term can be said to be definite versus the universal term can be said to be indefinite. Not all Calvinists believe in particularist atonement. This is also another issue that comes into play here. There are um, Amiralians and hypothetical universalists. We're not going to get into these ideas just to say, as in those would be like four point Calvinists. So that's what probably is more, more the term that people know those people by. And even those two terms are different. Just to say that people have sought to grapple with the difficult passages in scripture about the atonement for centuries. 
And of course, we're not going to end this debate today. But nonetheless, I think it's valuable since Mike has got a very, very large um, viewership. And, you know, I do appreciate the work that Mike does. He does a lot of great work. And I'm in no way, shape or form trying to say anything negative about him, about his ministry, about the, the great Bible work he does. Nor am I trying to say, you know, that, that if you're not a Calvinist, you're not a Christian. None, you know, I know there may be some, but there are also equally non-Calvinists who have this idea that Calvinists are not Christians. None of those things I think are true. And I think it's important to put that to bed before we get into such a difficult topic. Non-Calvinists often argue that universal atonement is a done deal and that Calvinists need some philosophical reason to account for the doctrine of limited atonement. This is by no means the case and I will attempt to show why using lots of Bible passages. The objections from Trinitarian harmony, which we will see in part three, and double jeopardy, arise out of the context of the biblical texts and should never be seen as philosophical constructs that somehow trump scripture. I think somehow this has, has really been misunderstood. I think if you really carefully read the work of, let's say, John Owen, whom, who was quoted frequently, I think you could arguably firmly say that he believes in limited atonement or particular redemption, as I'm going to try and call it throughout this video, based on scripture. And then he had additional other arguments that he used that were secondary to his primary arguments from scripture. And I think that's reasonable. I think, you know, when Luther was um, put in front of the Catholic um, Cardinal Cajetan, he said famously that unless he can be shown from scripture or given a rational reason why he should recant, then he won't. And I think that's, that's a good way to look at how we should do theology. You, you can tell with some of my videos that I'm a big fan of Martin Luther. This is by no means the case, as in, you know, the universal atonement is not a done deal from Scripture at all, as far as I'm concerned. And I hope that you will be able to follow through with many of the passages that I treat today. Now, as we go through, there's going to be lots and lots of Bible passages that I will put up on the slides that I won't be able to look at because this video would be far too long. And I would suggest if you haven't looked at them, um, as you're watching, if you're watching this as a recording, stop the, the video and read every passage that I that I put in the slides. I will read a, 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 a fair few of them, but I will not have time to read them all. The objections from, as you know, we'd said that already. So somehow humbly said, I said many non-Calvinists have misunderstood this. So let's move on. So first of all, let's just establish some ground rules. I'm going to assume for this argument that we all hold to the inerrancy of the Bible in its original languages. And I would refer you to the Chicago Statement on um, Biblical Inerrancy. This is a, an evangelical document. Um, both Armenians and Calvinists and um, people who don't sit in the Armenian or the Calvinist camp would ascribe to that evangelical document. Um, about inerrancy. It's a great place to start to learn if, you, if you're not sure about um, biblical inerrancy. Proof texting, I think, is a, is a difficult thing and it can lead to wrong conclusions. We are, of course, all subject to falling into this trap because since the last two or three hundred years, at some point, I think in the 17th or 18th century, a French um, man created the, the chapter and verses for the Bible. And since then, we've got chapter and verses in our Bible, but the original texts don't have that. And it leads you, I think, to more reading larger chunks of scripture. And I think it's very beneficial in your own personal study to actually read entire books of the Bible as you're reading them, um, and not just a few verses and de definitely not just individual verses. Each verse we seek to use in favor of our argument must be read in its immediate context and in line with the remainder of Scripture. As an example, 1 John 2, 2 on its own would definitely lead to a universalist view of the atonement. I would agree. I, I think that verse is a very powerful statement about giving you the idea that, the, the, that Jesus died for all people in all times at all places. 
and th their sins are forgiven and to, and basically it's just we're waiting for the for the atonement that Jesus did for everyone to be applied if you just take that that verse on its face value yes i would agree the problem though is is that that's not how we should read the bible so we should first read other writings i this is what i do by the same author because frequently if you let's say if you read 1 John 2 2 and then you read other let's say the gospel of John by John then you you will find other statements that will clarify whether your interpretation of a particular verse is true or not whether you've misunderstood it or whether you've understood it correctly and I think as we will look at that objection in part three you'll see that actually the Bible interprets itself rather well and gives us all the clarity we need um, when we're not sure about something. If our interpretation leads to a conclusion that we interpret an author in a contradictory manner by comparing his various statements on a particular topic, we, dis we should naturally, and I know this is difficult to be honest, I, I face the same question myself often, we should assume we've misunderstood something We've missed something or we've interpreted, we've simply interpreted wrong. So there are three, well, I would suggest there are three ways of, of viewing salvation at large. And considering that the word atonement, it means to make one again that was previously a part, I think we can look at um, the three ways that Jesus atoned. Jesus was death was not an actual atonement but it made atonement possible in other words it becomes actual when the sinner exercises his own faith and i i'd say that 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 is largely the view of most evangelicals today the second idea is the reform position that jesus was an actual atonement for the sins of a group of people whom god chose before the foundation of the world and only these are delivered from sin's penalty, but they're also delivered fully and finally. In other words, they can't lose that deliverance. This was largely the reformed view from the time of largely Martin Luther all the way through to the Pur Puritan era leading into the first great awakening in America. The second great awakening in the 18th century in America was a big change in the way people viewed scripture. And so, and then of course, there's a third view. Jesus' death was also an actual atonement for the sins of all people, with the result, of course, that all people will be saved. I think this is a reasonable way of looking at looking at um, how the atonement. If you say the atonement was actual, but it also becomes actual when you exercise your faith. That somehow doesn't ring true logically to me. Some people may hold to that view, but I don't think that's really a genuine view that you can hold from Scripture. I'm just giving you background information before we get into the actual Bible verses. Um, and so uh, one of the problems I think people face today is that they grow up with churches, society, ideas that we are formed by growing up in school and in everywhere you know particularly if you grew up in a country like america where you may have heard lots of bible things in a school you will hear the predominant view of the day presented in school at large and so if you grow up with this view and you you reach the time when you become a christian maybe it's in your early adulthood and then all of a sudden you hear uh, the reformed view that will rub up against that particular view of yours well that of course will cause you problems and I, that is exactly how i experienced it i became across reformed theology in my in my late 30s early 40s and for me my first reaction was was wow like it was a very negative reaction initially because i just that's not how i'd ever read the scripture but it was through a lot of study that I came to realize, well, that, but actually that's what the scripture does say. And I eventually decided to bow my knee to scripture rather than my own ideas. Now, that in, in saying that, I'm not suggesting that Mike is not bowing his knee to scripture. So please don't misread what I'm trying to say. Um, but the point what I'm trying to make is that if you were to project yourself back into the 17th century in sort of the reformed um, and then the early, early mid and late Puritan area where the predominant view of, of redemption was a, of a limited sense, then 
you would not have had any such revulsion by hearing that in the church because that was the predominant view people grew up with. So sometimes also we have reactions towards things because of just our preconditioning in the way and we bring our own preconceived ideas or presupposed ideas to the text of scripture. That is just human nature. And it's a hard task, it's hard work sometimes to lay them down. There's a lot of work to be done. So if one is true, then Jesus died to make all humans savable. And in their salvation, and then, sorry, their salvation depends on their operating their free will to exercise faith and continue to do so until they die. Most who hold to two also reject the idea that God elected humans to salvation in a Calvinist sense. Or some do say that, well, God elected some in a Calvinist sense and some not. But for me personally, I think that's a pretty preposterous idea to hold both of those ideas because you're really saying God created some with a better chance than others that somehow, you know, questions the idea of God's justice. But we're not going to get into that. So also hold that God elected human beings, um, or so, sorry, reject that God elected human beings to salvation in any Calvinist sense, since that would slice humans into haves and have-nots and put the elect at a clear advantage over the non-elect. That's what I said earlier. So when Mike was speaking on Romans 8, he clearly said he can accept the Calvinist interpretation of the elect in Romans 8, which I find somewhat troubling because that somewhat means to me, and maybe I've misunderstood him, so I'll give, give him the benefit of the doubt there, but that means that he accepts that there is an atonement for the elect and the non-elect Whereas I think the traditional Armenian position is that is that you are elected based on your foreknowledge, as in God f looks through the time of history and and sees that you choose tr Jesus with your free libertarian will, and He elects you on the basis of your free choice. I'm not suggesting that's what the Bible says, but I I would say that is more the traditional libertarian. Um, free will Arminian stroke view. Of course, there's a lot of nuances in there and sometimes people don't like themselves being called Arminian and I, under, I understand that. If so, I can't see how Mike's God can escape the charge of being unjust if there's two classes of people since the elect are a clear advantage. In the Calvinist view, all humans are equally dead in sin, whether Jew or Gentile, whether you know, whether you're black or white skin, whether you're brown skin, whether you're of Asian or European descent makes no difference. All human beings born in Adam are dead in their sins. All humans deserve the just and right punishment for their willful and chosen sin. So we're not only born in sin, but we willfully and freely voluntarily choose to sin. So no one deserves mercy. Now, some people may balk at that and think that we do deserve mercy, but that's not what the Bible clearly shows. And mercy in the Bible is not something that someone deserves. It's something that God freely chooses to give. God could have not sent Jesus and we would all stand before God at the day of judgment guilty as charged. I think you, you have to accept that as the biblical witness. The point here is that God mercifully sent his son. He didn't have to. To the degree we have sinned, we will be punished. But since we all sinned, we're all guilty. We're all going to be punished. And, and that does not bode well for humans. God chose to give mercy to some. This is the Calvinist position. According to many verses in the New Testament, in fact, I'd say, and the number of people that God has chosen is a very large uncountable number. So it's not as if God has chosen this minute lot of people out of all history. And, and the victory that we read of in the Bible is not very a victory at all because most people go to hell. That's not the picture I believe the Bible tells us. God is just and merciful. This is a conundrum that, that both sides must deal with, that God must be just, because that's what he tells us he is, and he is also loving, kind, and merciful. And, of course, I, I believe Romans tells us very clearly that in the cross of Christ, those two forces, uh, and somewhat opposing forces, meet to deal with this conundrum. So I, of course, believe that option number two is true. My main reason for believing this, though, is that the Bible never anywhere makes a clear and precise statement that the atonement was not actual. This is to me a really important point. 
people say it's not actual laws and it's it can't, it's only done when it's applied to you when you believe and while there are some parts of it as in let's say justification is truly only applied to you when you come to believe that's the the, the judicial thing that happens to you when you come to believe in Christ you are justified but the actual saving work of Jesus was truly and really finished and it, nowhere does the Bible give us an idea that Jesus died to make humans savable. That's not stated in any passage of Scripture anywhere. All the arguments made by non-Calvinists, and Mike used this as well, that Jesus then turned away God's wrath from people in, actual, in an actual sense, and, and hence some are no longer under God's wrath because they're God's elect, and before they believe are based on a false assumption that people misunderstand two different things that we will look at this and that is the objective truth in scripture versus the subjective truth of how we experience the objective truth and of course the bible is full of objective truth claims but we don't always experience them always in the same way and so this is really important to understand there is a difference between an objective truth claim and a subjective truth claim when jesus said his famous words on the cross it is finished did he, and this is crucial of how you, this question determines your belief of the atonement, how you answer it. Number one, did he say something of the like, I've run the race, my death has made the way for you to have a ticket to the race. Come and punch your ticket to get into the race. And if you run the race until the end, if you keep getting up and you persevere, I will be at your side to help you. If you then do all of these things, you will finally be saved. This is sort of the typical Wesleyan, Methodist, Armenian, and I think pretty much the modern evangelical position. Or, I have completed all the requirements of the race for all those who will, in fact, run the race. My grace is sufficient for them to start, to run, and to complete the race. My grace is so strong that it will produce in them the very desire to start the race, run the race, overcome all the race huddles, hurdles. And that's not to say that they are not called to or have to run and overcome them. But the point here is that the primary cause, not the secondary cause, which would be our actions of obedience, the primary cause is God's grace. Even if they fall and stumble along the way, they will most assuredly finally complete that race. Now, I think that is a true view. And of course, it's just my explaining of it, of the biblical terms of mercy and grace. All those people God gave to me, they don't know it yet, as many will come to the successive generations. The gospel is the good news to be preached indiscriminately to all to enable the Holy Spirit to do his work in those God elected to receive grace. Their response in faith is a demonstration that the Holy Spirit has done his work of regeneration. So by no means does a, does a Calvinist believe that if, if someone seeks for Jesus and repents of their sin and asks for forgiveness, they will never be turned down. Because the very fact that they did ask forgiveness shows that the Holy Spirit is at work in their heart. So there's no such thing as a person wanting to be elect and God turns them away. This is a, 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 an oxymoron. That's, such a phrase doesn't exist in the text of Scripture. Whilst there are many references to believers being called to obey, persist, persevere until the end, and these could fit, of course, number one. They often do look like they do. There isn't a single reference in Scripture that clearly states that the work of Jesus, in line with one, even those passages 1 John 2, 2, that seem to indicate Jesus died for all, do not say Jesus died to enable you to be savable. They all indicate Jesus actually died to save, as in to accomplish it. And this is a really important issue of language that we moderns often fail to see. All the perseverance passages fit too quite well because it's not as if the Calvinist suggests that you don't need to persevere the point is just who is causing the perseverance in its primary versus its secondary sense so all the perseverance passages fit too quite well even the really difficult ones but the actual work of Christ in salvation comports really well with two 
Eve, and this is important, I want to state this clearly, we all limit the atonement unless you are a universalist. A, some limit it in its effect. Christ died for all, but not all will be saved. Some will reject the gospel, and some who receive the gospel will reject it later. That's in line with position one earlier. Position B, some limit in it, it in its scope. Christ did not die for all, but all for whom he did die will actually be saved. This is where, of course, you limit it in its scope. Imagine, if you will, an analogy, and I know this is a bit of a contrived analogy, so don't, please don't want to stone me when you, when you don't like it. Imagine a bridge across the Grand Canyon and all must cross it to be saved. A, a broad, wide bridge that goes only 90% of the way. Everyone can fit onto the bridge, but you must somehow cross the last 10% yourself. And of course, a, a, a fairly easy way of recognizing that, that that's not going to happen. A narrow bridge that goes all the way across the canyon. Everyone who gets onto the bridge will get to the other side. Of course, this isn't an analogy because fails in, in a lot of different ways. Because if everybody was trying to get onto the bridge to get to the other side, that wouldn't be a true reflection of what happens, what we see in the Bible. Because the, lots and lots of people, the Bible tells us, outright reject God's offer. So they don't, get, they don't even try to get onto the bridge. So please don't take that analogy as, as a true for all. It's only an analogy. As with all analogies, and there are lots of them in the scripture, some aspects of an analogy will not necessarily fit the truth. It's only to give, often to awaken an emotion, to make you think about something and to make you consider. So what words are used about salvation in the text of Scripture? So we have things like died with Christ. We have redemption. redemption. We have propitiation, expiation, reconciliation, atonement. Oh, actually, we'll come to, of course, an interesting fact about atonement that even I wasn't sort of, it didn't occur to me until I started looking into this more deeply. What words does the Bible use to tell us how Jesus saves? As we look at these terms, have the original question in mind. Did, actually, did Jesus actually accomplish salvation or did he die to make humans savable? Did the believer in a real sense die with Christ as he was crucified? I'd suggest you, we're not going to read those now, is Galatians 2.20 and Romans 5.6-8. Read those two passages and you will see that in some real sense, the believer died with Christ on the cross. This is Galatians 2.20 is very explicit about this. But of course, this provides a real conundrum if all humans... Jesus died for all humans, then, of course, all humans, in some sense, died with Jesus on the cross, and yet they're not going to be saved. That doesn't fit what Paul is saying. Let's have a look at the, the word redemption. Imagine a chattel slave market where slave owners are, pu are putting up slaves for sale. Terrible thing that happened in America, and I'm not chastising Americans for it because these things happen all over the, the, the English-speaking world. Um, the slave, you know, I live in a country, I live in Australia, and what the Australians did to the Aborigines was absolutely shocking and no, no, no um, better than what the Americans did to the African Americans. The slave has no say at all in the transaction. He can will to be bought or not. And shoot, this is the, the word the Bible uses to talk about salvation. Redemption is in real terms the buying back from slavery and and a slave is not said to be one who says oh i want to be bought by this master i want to go over to this one or i want to be bought by this master that's not how that's not how, how a slave exchange happens and why does the bible use words of that nature the bible of course often uses metaphor it's not to be in interpreted as a like for like they are language devices that are meant to evoke an idea in the hearer and reader we can see um, this in 1 Peter 1, 18, verse 9, 18 to 19, and Galatians 3, verse 13. And in that verse, Galatians 3, 13, note that it is us in view here, which is a very particular language. 
And I understand that Mike raises this point from time to time about the negative inference fallacy. He could probably raise this issue on Galatians 3.13 here. But I would note that when you look at the language of the Bible at large, when certain things are repeated over and over and over and over again, you get a bigger picture of what's going on in the Bible. And it becomes very difficult to accept this idea of a neg negative inference fallacy. Revelations 5, 9, very strong um, passage. So I believe redemption is best stated in these four terms rather than what often people do. The gospel reaches each individual between the accomplished and the, the applied parts. So these four terms that I think best explain redemption is redemption predestined, which is basically God making choices before he even created the world. Redemption accomplished, which is the work that Jesus finished when he died on the cross and rose again. Redemption applied, which is those aspects of redemption that, that come into view subjectively with each believer. Not objectively, but subjectively. Well, in some degree, objectively too. But there are some things that are true at the moment of accomplished. And of course, in the end, redemption consummated when Jesus returns and we meet Jesus. The next term that the Bible uses is propitiation. Now, I'm going through these terms before I get into actual texts that we're going to look at about particular redemption. I'm doing this only just to give a bit of background. Propitiation is to turn away the wrath of God. This language I would suggest is not consistent with a universalist position because it's you know if you imagine if you imagine two hostile countries where they've now signed a peace treaty and then all of a sudden the one revokes the peace treaty and now of course I understand that in in the real world sometimes countries actually do do that so analogies as I said are not ever like for like but it's not the idea that the Bible is aiming to give us since God's wrath will be poured out on Judgment Day on all unrepentant sinners, it's inconsistent, I believe, and even though Mike doesn't agree and doesn't like that, I think it's inconsistent to say his wrath has been turned away for all when it will be poured out on many for whom it was turned away. That is, that is an inconsistent position. It may be a possible solution to the problem if the biblical text tells us so, but I think as we will see in light of the biblical text, that is not the picture the Bible gives us. We see as an example in Romans 3.25, a very strong passage about the turning away of God's wrath. Hebrews 2.14-17, to this is actually a very particularist passage and we may see that repeated later. Um, we see clearly there the propitiation idea is, is for the offspring of Abraham and then in the same light, we see the propitiation idea presented with a clear picture that Christ made propitiation for his people. And of course, the logical conclusion from that text, it is the sons of Abraham. And of course, that means it's those who believe. And I think also when you look at it, therefore, in history, the, the earlier Wesleyan position was that they agreed with the reform position of total depravity. In other words, they agreed that no man by himself can come to God and it needs a work of grace in the person before they can come to God. In other words, they become the sons of Abraham by faith and Jesus, of course, therefore only died for those. So they actually believed in a, in a form of limited atonement still as well, which is largely what positions people reject today. But these two passages fit very well with the idea of God electing a people before the beginning of time, and they don't fit very well with the universalist position. If you deny it was an actual atonement, you must also deny, I think, consistently, it was an actual propitiation. In other words, you must deny the idea that Jesus' death turned away God's wrath until the person accepts it in belief. And in that sense, you, you really must, I think, say that if Jesus died for all, he really died to make all savable. He didn't turn God's wrath away from them yet. 
really it was an offer to propitiate and upon you receiving the offer you are propitiated i think that is the consistent view of somebody who believes in that christ died for every single person on the planet reconciliation it means to make peace between two warring parties second corinthians 5 17 to 21 in this passage there is a clear sense that it happened in the past now as i said please i if you i'm i'm there's a lot of biblical passages i've got to get through and this video would be several hours if i go through every single one when i quote them i would suggest you read them in this passage there is a clear sense that it happened in the past is happening now and will be completed in the future it is an it is not an either or but it is a both and romans 5 verse 10 there is a clear sense that we were past tense reconciled to god at the very day christ died for sinners i don't think the argument that mike raised in his video that um that everything you know, jesus basically died for you but that none of all of that really applicative language happens until you come to faith that's not the picture the bible gives us and note, of course, here there's a term world, which we're not going to get into yet at the moment. We will later a bit. There's a broad range of uses of this world, world in the New Testament. We haven't got time to get into them all here in this video. But for now, hold the thought as it will deal with that particular redemptive passages next. Atonement. This is an interesting one. This is to make one those, sorry, to make one those who were formerly at odds. In the Old Testament, atonement or to atone is nearly always used in a particularist sense, never in a universalist sense. Either it was for the particular group of people, only the Israelites, all the Israelites, or a family, a, a figurehead of a family, or an individual, because there are a broad range of different sacrifices that could atone for certain different sins that you committed. And it was often applied to you only or to your family or to a group of people or to Israel at large, but never, of course, to the Gentile nations. This must be the basis for how we understand this concept in the New Testament, unless we have a very good reason to do otherwise. The term atonement, interestingly enough, is not used anywhere in the New Testament. The Old Testament word atonement, aton or to atone, like the, the, the root word that includes various different renditions, occurs 103 times and nearly always in the form of the Hebrew term kafar, which means to cover. And if you think back to the Garden of Eden, when man tried to cover his nakedness, a futile attempt to cover up his shame for disobeying God. What happened? God stooped down and made them covers from an animal hide. Adam didn't ask him to do that. He didn't go and repent to God. And then God acted on behalf of Adam's faith. No, God just stooped down in his mercy and did so. A death was required to cover for the sin. And all importantly, God initiated this act, foreshadowing, I believe, how atonement was to happen from here on. In the Old Testament, the idea of atonement was to cover. And it could never actually eradicate or properly deal with the sin problem. We, of course, figure that out only in the New Testament after Jesus has died and buried and raised. And we have all the amazing revelation got given to God through the apostolic ministries of what we now have as the Bible. And particularly the book of Hebrews tells us that exceptionally well. The Old Testament offerings and sacrifices were only a type and shadow of what's what to come. The work of Christ was far beyond cover it was it, 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 it it's and i think it is that the reason why the new testament actually uses different more explicit terms to spell out the work of christ that it was far greater than just covering apart from the terms we've already seen there are more um, in hebrews 1 3 we see purification for sins in hebrews 7 27 we see jesus being offer, offered as himself a sacrifice for sins in Hebrews 10, 3 and 11, we see him taking away sins. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we see um, us being made whole, as in saving us from our sins. So the broad range of terms in the New Testament do not fit the idea of making people savable. 
they far more clearly point to Christ accomplishing actually and fully, completely, the task of salvation. Christ is a true saviour, not just a person who made us savable. And I say this with no intent to offend anybody who disagrees. So objective and subjective ideas. Now I think to explain this best, I'm just going to simply read a quote from, from an early Princeton theologian by the name of B.B. B. Warfield. People who've looked at the subject will have come across his name. It lies in confusing redemption itself, which is objective and takes place outside of us with its subjective effects, which take place in us. At this point, in this point, he's actually arguing against all those people who say, you know, n not just, but this was one of the things that he was arguing against. He was arguing against people who suggested this idea that Jesus died to make a sick person well. In fact, in, in other words, embedded in the atonement was this this implicit promise that you, if, if you prayed, your sickness would be taken away because Jesus died for it. And clearly, I think that is there's another story, but I don't think that is a true um, proper interpretation of the biblical text. So it's failing to recognize that these subjective effects of redemption are wrought in us gradually and in a definite order. Ideally, all of God's Christ's children were saved before the foundation of the world when they were set upon by God's love and given by the Father to the Son to be saved by him. Objectively, they were saved when Christ died for them on the tree, purchasing them to himself by his own precious blood. Here's what, where the difference between objective and subjective comes in. This salvation was made their personal possession in principle when they were regenerated by the Holy Spirit, purchased for them by the death of Christ on their behalf. It was made over to them judicially on their believing in Christ, in the power of the Holy Ghost thus given to them. It is completed in them in its full effects only when at the judgment day they stand sanctified souls clothed in purified bodies before the throne of God meet for the inheritance of the saints in light. I like to, to build on particular issues with a way of how the gospel unfolded and I like to think that the major themes that we see throughout the Bible should not occur just in one of the epistles. Like if you find a scripture that makes a doctrine, a very particular doctrine, and especially when it comes to salvation, that you don't find anywhere in the Gospels, but you, you, you read it somehow out of the epistle, I would suggest that you've probably misunderstood that epistle. So I'm going to go through this process by looking at the Gospel of Mark, because it's the shortest succinct gospel that I think was written for the very early church who was largely illiterate and it was written in a way that they could learn it off by heart. And I, I, I think that, that all the major Christian doctrines are stated in the gospel of Mark. And therefore, if that's all you ever had, you would get the m most important things that you need to know about Christianity. So if we, we're going to go from the gospel of Mark. We're going to move on to the gospel of Matthew and Luke. Then we're going to get into the Gospel of John, the book of Acts, and we're going to work through the rest of the New Testament. I'm not, of course, going to look at every single passage because that would just simply take too long. So we're looking at the moment, a particular redemption in the Gospel of Mark. So briefly, of course, we're not going to look at all of these. Again, I would suggest if you haven't read them in a while, stop the clock and read them. In Mark 1, 15, we see that Jesus was sent to a particular group of people, namely his own. We, we see that repeated in that Jesus says that is particularly why he came. We see these kind of the same kind of language in chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. It is being given to you, whereas it's not being given to others, which is particularly rubs up against any kind of universalist idea. And then we see two very clear passages about particularity in redemption in Mark 10:45 and Mark 14:24 where it's very clearly stated that Jesus give, will give his life for many and he will his blood and he will purchase and you know he will pour out his blood sorry for many not all for many 
Now, of course, you, Mike might, might say, well, you know, that's a negative inference fallacy that could, of course, include the non-elect. That is true. But I think in context, you see here that, of course, the language of the elect is starting to appear just in the very first chapter in that Jesus was sent to his own. Importantly, the, we must note that the clearly particularist language of these gospel accounts in Jesus' own words, and we must not take them lightly. And importantly, on the flip side of this, there is not a single universalist redemption passage in the gospel of Mark. Mark says nowhere that Jesus will or did die for all, as in all without exception. Let's move on to particular redemption in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And again here, we're just briefly quoting the passages because there's just simply way too many to look at. Again, Matthew says clearly that he will save his people. In chapter 15, we're told he's only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I don't see how you, there, of course, I think that statement is so clear that you can't make a negative inference fallacy statement out of that because he's using the delimiter only. Matthew 20, 28, you see the same statement of ransom. And for who is it? For many. Matthew 20, 20 22, verse 14, many and few are mentioned here, not all. Matthew 26, poured out for many. Luke 1 68 he redeemed his people again it seems like each gospel starts with the same kind of idea and we see again a repetition of the same particularist language in Luke 2 34 and again in the gospels of Matthew and Luke so we've now got three major gospels that don't give a single account of universal redemption for all. Now this I think is very profound and I think this is indeed troubling because Jesus is the one who died for our sins on the cross. Troubling for the universalist, I should say, of course. I don't think it's troubling for, for the person who, who recognizes that G Jesus actually died for a set group of people. Now we're moving on to particular redemption in the Gospel of John. And because these are much more in-depth and longer statements because the Gospel of John is more of a theological treatise rather than telling the story accounts of um, the redemption or the story accounts of Jesus. We are going to look at some of these in more detail. So we're going to, out of the ones that you see listed in the slide, we're going to look at John 6, 37 to 40. We're going to look at John chapter 10, a number of verses. And we're going to look at John chapter 17, also a number of verses. So let's first of all go to John 6, 37. All that the Father come, gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, that, sorry, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, as in everyone who beholds the Son. Um, I'm just going to fix something here in the view. Um, I'm going to highlight, show verse numbers because it's a little bit difficult to, um, to see what's going on there. So let's go to verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 65. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the father. So without getting into the in-depth 
you know, we could spend an hour just talking about that single passage there because there's a lot more than just limited atonement going on in that particular passage. But note just the particularity of language that that the only people who come to Jesus are the ones who God or the Father has first of all granted to him to come. And so, in other words, that does not wrap itself around a universalist language of redemption. And I, and I would note here that as we get more and more and more language together, as we see more and more pa passages pile up, we see the evidence in favor of a particularist view of redemption get very, very strong. Sure, if you see one scripture and there's lots of other ones, well, you could maybe case that we have misunderstood it. But as the evidence from all sorts of different angles mounts, you must come to the conclusion that God is trying to send us a message. So we're going to look at John chapter 10. And we're reading 10, well, we'll just read from 10, uh, from 11 onward. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down, sorry, lays down his life for the sheep. Note here, the good shepherd doesn't lay down his life for all. He lays down his life for the sheep. And so then, of course, you need to figure out, well, who is a sheep and who is not? Is a sheep just all are sheep by until they decide to be? Well, that's not what the Bible says. And we will work through this in, in, a, in, a, in, in the concluding verses. So we'll jump further. And we'll actually start from verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, which they will hear. Sorry. And they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Clearly, this is an indication that initially the sheep Jesus was talking about was were sheep amongst the Jews, and there the other sheep in another flock, of course, are people in amongst the Gentiles. Let's jump forward to verse 26 to verse 29. But you do not believe, and this is really important because this is a causal statement. And he's telling the Pharisees this point at that moment. These are the people who reject him. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. He's not saying this the other way round, which would need it to be true in order for a universalist position to be true. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. These are, are incredibly descriptive statements about sheep. They're not prescriptive statements about this is what you must do in order for this to happen. These are indicative truths that Jesus tells us about the story of salvation. And of course, the, the, these have great impact and comport on the Calvinist doctrine of the pre preservation or preserving of the saints, whichever words you want to use. In other words, that a true Christian can never fall, even though they may stumble and they may fall badly. They will never truly, finally fall away from God. Because Jesus's words cannot be undone. But the point here that comes very strongly out of this passage is Jesus gave his life as a shepherd for his sheep. He did not give his life as a shepherd for non-sheep. Let's look at John 17. And we'll look, we're starting from verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all you have, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So again, we have this strong statement that those whom the Father gives, Jesus will give eternal life. We move on to verse 4. 
I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Again, Jesus saved. He didn't make savable. He completed the task. Let's move on to verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Of course, he's talking to the apostles here, but we will see later, of course, that Jesus refers that same statement to the people who are still to come. Verse 9. I ask you on their behalf. Note this for the later issues that we have with intercession. Jesus does not intercede for the people who are not his. I ask you on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I'm no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Now let's move on to verse 20. I do not, and again, we see this also importantly, again, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. Obviously, he was referring in the initial bit to his, his group of disciples. But for those who will believe in me through their word. But the all important truths of this passage are, and the previous passage in, in the Gospel of John chapter 10, is that there is a very particular view of redemption in the Gospel of John. Now, so, so far we've established that the Gospels are filled with particular redemptive statements, and there is not a single and we will look at the John 3.16 statements later, so I'm not going to suddenly say that they're not part of the gospel or that we should ignore them. Of course we shouldn't. It's a beautiful statement. One of the most glorious passages in the gospel of John. I'm by no means suggesting that we should ignore that. Not at all. But the point here is that there is no universal statement comparable to 1 John 2.2, 2, and so therefore we must ask ourselves whether we've read 1 John 2.2 2 in light of the rest of Scripture and, or whether we've simply understood, misunderstood it. We'll come to that. And there are actually really good answers to, to this passage that I think you may find um, encouraging. But in any case, so, so far there are no, there is just the evidence points very strongly in a particularist position. The next thing we're going to do is look at the book of Acts. So we're looking at particular redemption in the book of Acts. Acts 7, I would suggest, um, is a succinct summary of the entire Old Testament, including all the way up to um, Jesus' incarnation, his death, burial, and re resurrection on the cross. And so if you haven't read Acts 7 in a while, read it. But I think you can't help but notice some very strong particular issues in this passage and you must deal with them if you don't believe in particular redemption. God appeared to Abraham and when you read that story there is no Abraham turning to God in faith and therefore God appears to him. It is simply God appears out of nowhere to Abraham. He stoops down and has mercy on Abraham who was a pagan. He did not believe in God before God came to him. Why did God appear to Abraham and nowhere, no one else? Many people groups all over the world were um, in slavery at this point in time, but God chose to save Israel when they were in slavery. God didn't have to choose Israel alone. He could have chosen people from all over the world in slavery, but he didn't. He chose Israel, a particular group of people. You see, the entire story of the Old Testament is very strongly particularist. It's, it, it screams out particular redemption. The Jews had a perfect redeemer in Moses, trained at the best court of the day, but they rejected him and another 40 years pass, showing total depravity in, in its early stages, as in, you know, as in very early in the passages of Scripture. God sends Moses, does miracle after miracle, and forces the hand of Pharaoh. The Jews, this is important, the Jews could not leave off their own accord, nor was their rescue their own free will choice. It was God's mercy 
who literally dragged them out of Egypt. A perfect picture, I believe, of monogistic salvation. And I mean monogistic in the sense that not that you have a free will choice, but God does everything else. I'm talking about monogistic in the sense that your free will choice had nothing to do with it. Read Acts 7, 51 to 53. It is a perfect display of what the reformers, including Martin Luther, called the bondage of the will. And if you've never read that book, I would strongly recommend you read it. Here he really does a, an incredible job at explaining what he believes about free will. And he looks at all the passages of Scripture, starting from the book of Genesis all the way through to the end of the New Testament. It's a diatribe between him and Erasmus, who obviously believes in free will. Read verse 54 and compare this with the murderous attitude towards Christ. An honest student of the Reformation, I believe, will notice that Martin Luther well recognized what was later formulated in the doctrine of the total depravity. I've read lots of Martin Luther's stuff. The total inability of man to approach God by his own free will. And, of course, limited atonement is actually a direct consequence of the total depravity. Most Reformed theologians recognize that Reformed theology, in some ways, builds upon this cardinal doc Protestant doctrine that even the early Lutherans, I think, thoroughly believed in. I don't know where all the Lutherans stand today. But certainly in the early writings of the Lutheran Church, you see the idea of total depravity very firmly stated. It was like the, the Protestant battle cry in terms of um, why the Reformation is needed. So in the bondage of the will, Luther refers to all those passages in the Old Testament that have God commanding all to come to him and repent. And I'm re raising this only because Mike raised this in his video where he sort of gives the idea, well, if God, God calling you to repentance um, must by implication mean that you've got the ability to repent of your own free will. Erasmus saw in those passages an implicit recognition that God could not command what he first had not enabled man to do. Hence, he thought that man could at least approach God of his own accord and then needed grace to complete the rest. He was, if you like, the forefather of all moderns who believe salvation is offered to all on the basis of their free will choice. You know, give or take a few little corners and differences, but essentially that's his view and I think essentially he, he hit the nail on the head for what most people believe today. Luther rightly, in, in my, my humble opinion, recognized that God can indeed demand what we cannot do. And I think this is really crucially important to understand. Since many passages, both in the Old and New Testament, explicitly tell us that man in his state of sin cannot, as in does not have the ability to approach God, needs a miracle to do so. The early remonstrance, as in those people who, who stood against the reformed position, and it's out of those, the, the five points of Calvinism actually were originally the five points from the remonstrance. The five points of the Calvinists were actually a response to people who'd raised objection to the reformed the, the position. So the early remonstrance and later Wesleyan still also agreed, and this is important, the, the early remonstrance still believed in total depravity. Also agreed with and held to total depravity or total inability. And hence John Wesley believed in a concept he called prevenient grace, the moment when the Holy Spirit removes the deadness in sin. In other words, that immovable barrier that stops you from approaching God and puts the sinner in a state of neutrality where he can decide for himself whether he will come to Christ. So it's important to note this agreement with total depravity in different positions at that stage. It allowed Wesleyans and Calvinists to share a common platform during the revivals of the First Great Awakening in the US and the Methodist revivals in the UK. Clearly, many early Methodists were actually Calvinist. But of course, the problem is, I think, is that it's very, very difficult to make a case for provenient grace in the New Testament scripture. But we're not going to go there today. That's a subject of another video. Consider the heroin addict. He breaks into homes. He steals. 
He sometimes even murders in order to feed his addiction. He can do no other. And if you, if you don't know that, you, you, it might be good to get to know some people who've been through that trouble. The more he is addicted, the more he sins. Yet he is fully and completely culpable for his sins of stealing and, and sins of addiction. No court would let him off the hook just because he's an addict. Consider Romans 6 that explains the effects of the bondage to sin and indeed God does and has the right to call us to obey his commands all the while we do not have the ability to do so. It is the very way God uses the law as the schoolmaster, as Paul tells us in Galatians, to bring us to Christ. And I think, quite like no other, the early Lutherans recognized this. There is a, an, a brilliant book about the law and gospel, so to speak, by a guy called C.F. Walter, which I, if you've never read that, I would strongly recommend it. And if you've never looked at Lutheran theology, maybe it's a good time to do so. Let's look at, we'll read Acts 13 verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many had been appointed to earn eternal life, believed. Note the passage does not say many believed and were therefore appointed to eternal life. Let's look at Psalm 147, verse 19 and 20. Psalm 147, 19 to 20. He declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Acts 15, verses 12 to 18. Acts 15, 12. All the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Note here that Peter is the one who recognized that God is taking from the Gentiles a specific people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after these things I will rebuild. I will return, sorry, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Clearly here you see that the issue is that there are Gentiles who are called by God's name and God is returning them into his fold. Let's move on. Sorry. And we're going to look at um, the all world passages because I don't want to miss those. We're not going to look at John 6, 33 because we already looked at that. We're going to look at John 3, 16 and 17. And we're going to look at John chapter 4, verse 42. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, so ever, so, sorry, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And we'll just... Move on to, four, to chapter 4 as well, and then we'll talk about both. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what, what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So, of course, you know, reading John 4.42 in isolation of the rest of John and the rest of the Gospels, you could get the idea that Jesus died for the world but this is not the point of the passage if you read John chapter 4 you will see that Jesus did the unpardonable thing in in terms of Jewish culture at that stage he went through Samaria normally the Pharisee would do the long way around Samaria just in order so he would take a several day extra journey just so that he didn't have to get, go through the 
the country of Samaria to get to the other side. Jesus did not. He went into Samaria and he then, of course, shares the gospel in a very profound way with the woman at the well. And so the idea, I think, is not given in this passage that Jesus is the one, the savior of the whole world, as in everybody without exception. The point here is Jesus preaches to people without distinction. And in John 3, 16 to 17, nowhere is the idea given that Jesus died, as in to redeem the whole world, before they operate saving faith. So on its own, that passage even doesn't completely comport with a universalist position. And it certainly doesn't rub against a Calvinist position. I think this is crucially important. And so because we've seen a large number of Calvinist, as in particular redemptive statements in the Gospels, all of the synoptics, and of course also strongly stated in the Gospel of John, it would be wrong to interpret John 3.16 in opposition to the rest of John himself statement, as in statements John makes in the remainder of his gospel. And we saw in John chapter 6, verse, 30, verse 37 to 40, that there is a very particular idea, and yet there is also a world statement. In other words, giving a very strong credence, I think, to a weight to the idea that the world statement is not all without exception, but all without distinction. And particularly, we will see several passages as we continue working through the New Testament where the idea in the first century culture was that when all and all the world was meant, it, it simply meant not just Jews, but Gentiles. And often the word world actually is equated with Gentiles, which we already saw one of that. We're going to see that more as we keep working through the New Testament. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It is one of a very strong particular statement about who Jesus gave his life for. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now we know clearly that the church, of course, is the people of God. So Jesus did not give himself up for anybody outside of the church. Now, of course, you again, Mike could state this same argument that he did in with, when he raised that issue in Romans. We'll see that coming as we look at Romans 8. But I don't think that's relevant to this passage because I think, especially in the context that it is given, it is a very strong statement of who Jesus is died for. Let's read on and we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 to 10. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to the imprisonment as a criminal, but to the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. So, note here there's two things that I think are very important. First, Paul states what the gospel is. Then he says, this is why he suffers, or is why he is willing to suffer such hardship, and then he states what it is for. It is to get the gospel out to the elect. This makes no sense in a universal gospel sense. It would be an insult to the non-elect who can be saved because Paul said, I'm not in... Yeah, basically, Paul would be saying to them, well, I didn't labor for you. You weren't even in my purview. That would be an insult to those people. Let's read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him.
We'll move on and we'll read Hebrews 10, 12 to 14. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So we see again here, he, the writer of Hebrews agreeing with the many statements in the Gospels that Jesus died for many. And importantly, we see here that Jesus' death has completed. He not only died to save, to justify, in some sense, Jesus' has, death has in it the completion of everything, or all the way to the end, which is also a very strong statement of why the Reformed theologians believe, why I strongly believe that a, a true Christian cannot, cannot fall away from grace. Once you are truly saved, I know this rubs up against people who say, well, once saved, always saved. It doesn't mean that every Christian who professes the name of Christ will actually be saved because there are many false Christians in all sorts of churches. There are many people who make a false profession of Christ. So let's put that aside for a moment. But a person who comes to true saving faith will not, in fact, cannot because God's, God cannot lie. Now we're going to get into part two. We're looking, this is a, a brief break that I can cut the video into part two. Um, so this is where we're going to look at some of the difficult passages that, of course, also Mike raised in his objections. And we're going to try and do justice to all of his very sincere and very real objections. So we're looking at difficult passages in the epistles. And, we'll, you know, these will include and... Um, we're going to try and read all, all through these because I think they are really important. In fact, I think actually what I've done is I've looked at all the, the ones in 1 Timothy and in Titus and in 1 John, and I've excluded the passages in 2 Peter simply because they're very similar. And otherwise, you know, the video will be too long. But I recognize, of course, that those passages are the foundational passages, if you like, that people raise when they specifically say that Jesus died for all people. And I will at the outset say that if you read them in its own right, if you read them as truth statements without the rest of Scripture, that's the logical, natural conclusion you would come to. I'm, I'm not in any way, shape or form wanting to deny that this is a real difficulty. But we must do our work as Bible exegetes and exegete each passage in light of the remainder of scripture. So we're going to read through 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. First of all then, I urge that all that sorry, that entreaties, sorry, this this is a an old Bible program that I've got on one computer and it's using the NASB translation. So in case you wonder what the translation was. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all for the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So an important thing here to note is, of course, the issue of all. First, we are urged to pray for all. Now, I would suggest it can't possibly mean all without exception, because I don't think any Christian on the planet could do so. I think this is an unreasonable, impressing an idea onto the text of Scripture that I think in that moment when Paul says pray for all, I do not think that any Christian can legitimately pray for all those people who are in authority, because you would be praying every second of the day and you would not finish. You would never be able to do it in your lifetime. And then also, there are injunctions in the Bible that tells us 
that there are some people that we should not pray for. See that in 1 John 5, 16, and surely also people in the leadership, as we see later, would fall into those categories as well. So these are conundrums that we mustn't miss. So what I'm, I think strongly, therefore, points at is that this is a pr call to pray for people without distinction, not without exception. Then, as we move through this text, Paul urges prayers for kings and all those in authority. Again, given the wickedness of some rulers, surely Christian prayers would be expected to be... Because don't forget here, we're talking about intercessory prayer. This is a positive form of prayer. In other words, you know, there are different kinds of prayers in the Bible. Prayer is not just one subject that fits all. Um, and I think the sense of this passage is that this is meant as a positive prayer. Again, the, given the wickedness of some rulers, surely Christian prayers would be expected to be limited towards them. God is a just God. He does not expect people to pray for Hitler or for Stalin. Supplication, or let's say um, you're a woman and has been raped. God forbid that happens, but it does happen to people. God's not asking you to, to pray for the person who raped you. That would be a preposterous idea. Maybe at some point when God has given you the grace to move forward and you have actually managed to forgive, maybe you will be given that grace to pray. But it is not a command in that sense. Supplication is meant here, but rather calls us to ask for, you know, I think, you know, I think if you look at scripture broadly, we are called to ask for God's judgment on wicked leaders. And if you don't understand that, then you've missed the imprecatory Psalms and I suggest that you should read them. There, this, there's a good percentage of the Psalms that are imprecatory prayers. They're not, they're not um, intercessory prayers at all. They are not positive in any way, shape, or form. They are a form of lament calling upon God to bring down justice and his righteous anger on those people who are wicked. So the prime issue of the apostolic age that, that the early church faced as enduring Paul's ministry was shifting the gospel from Jews only to Jews and Gentiles. And, and I think that was basically culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, when basically the temple was completely destroyed. But if you look at the early letters, like the letter of Galatians, and you lead it, you see it littered all throughout, even Paul's letters to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy is littered with language that demonstrates that Pim Timothy should not be intimidated by the Judaizing heresy. And hence, the sense of all here is not Jews only, but people, but all people, as in Jews and Gentiles. This is when first century, first early Christians thought about all it was Jew and Gentile, not just Jew alone. Considering that to a first century Jew, every non Jew was a Gentile. There were no, you know, there was Jew and Gentile encapsulated the entire humanity. This interruption is confirmed by the context. See verse 7, for this purpose, preceding verses, the preaching of the gospel to all, I was appointed an apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, there's a strong inference, I think, here to demonstrate that the all in, in Paul's gospel, uh, in, in this particular passage to Timothy, was he is sent not just, he's not to the Jews, he's sent to the Gentiles. And those words, the all is to break out of that Jewish mindset and to say that the gospel was sent to the Gentiles. Not to Gentiles, everyone without exception, but Gentiles without a distinction. Verse 6 speaks of a ransom for all. If this is all without exception, it would contradict the words of Jesus, whom the gospels repeatedly tell us that he gave his life a ransom for many. Scripture repeatedly uses the term all for all kinds of literally literary devices. And, and we will see this. Um, and I want to read just one of these passages. So um, I haven't mentioned them here in the slide. I'll read them all out to you so you can write them down. And we're going to look at the first one. The first one is in Genesis chapter 7 verse 13 onwards. 
The second one is in Joel chapter 2 verse 28. We might actually look at that one as well because I think that's quite important. And Matthew 4, 23 to 24. So I'll restate it. Scripture frequently uses the term all as a literary device, not as a statement of all without extinction. Distinction, sorry, not extinction. So we're looking now at Genesis chapter 7, verse 13. This is, of course, on the preparation for the flood, Noah building the ark. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, and all sorts of birds. Now, if we read to there, we would realize this is an impossible conundrum because the scripture has just told us that all cattle after their kind. Well, that means every single cow that lived during the time of Noah was in the ark, which of course would have been an impossibility. There's no, an ark couldn't be built even in a hundred years of building and even with a thousand people building it, an ark couldn't have been built to fill the ark with every single cow that lived on this time. And you see, this is, this is not meant as a all without distinction. And so as we read on, we see scripture clarify. So they went into the ark to Noah, all two by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, men and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him and the Lord closed it behind him. And I want to actually look at Joel ch um, chapter 2 verse 28 as well because I think this is quite pertinent and it won't take much time. And anybody who's read Acts chapter 2 will remember this passage well. It will come about after this time that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Now, that can't possibly be true in a wooden literal sense that the Holy Spirit was poured out on every single person, which is what it said, all mankind. But you see, note that the, the scripture as it is quoted by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, note what he says. He says, this fulfills that scripture. So this is a... I guess this is a clarion call to be really careful with the text of Scripture. We must do due diligence when we read statements in Scripture, not just to take them at face value in its own right, outside of the context and outside of the broader context of Scripture. Scripture often makes these general statements of all without distinction or all in the main majority, where it does not or cannot mean all without exception. There's another example of it in 1 John 5, 19. And of course, this one is in the same letter that, that, that we see 1 John 2, 2. I'd ask you to read it. 1 John 5, 19. And it is also evidence in that verse that Paul often uses the word world and Gentiles synonymously, which is also evidence, therefore, that when he used that term in 1 John 2, 2, that that is what he likely had in mind. Note, compare that to Romans 11, 12 to 15. And remember that in Romans 11, 12 to 15, it's all about salvation. Note the connection and please be carefully reading that as you read Romans 11, 12 to 15. Note the connection in those verses between world and Gentiles used synonymously. This was a very common thing in the early texts of the New Testament. The next objection we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For it is this we labor, sorry, it is, for, it's, it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. And then afterwards, I'd like to read the context, verses 1 to 7 because I think this also helps us understand this passage. 
But the Spirit explicitly says in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared with their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the means of the word of God and prayer. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself with the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but... Godliness is profitable for all things, that it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. The point here is, in this passage, that Paul is very strongly speaking about the Judaizers. Those people who say, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't meet on this day, don't meet on that day, and all sorts of other things. This was the ugly heresy that the early church had to deal with. And what were they, in essence, saying? Is you had to obey Jewish law. You had to, in effect, be like a Jew in order to be saved. In other words, really what they wanted, they did not like this idea that the gospel was going out to the Gentiles. And in this light, Paul says to Timothy that the gospel is to go out to all the world. It is not to state that Jesus died for every single person on the planet. That is not what we are reading when we read that passage in its true context. And especially when we realize that is, how do we deal with this passage of especially those who believe? Now, I, could, I, I, could, I believe it could be a literary device to emphasize that one is saved through faith. It could also be, you know, like we see this particularly when we look at 1 Timothy 3, 2, as in this idea of emphasis, we see that is 1 Timothy 3, 2, we're told that elders are, a, are to be able to teach. And then we see in 1 Timothy 5, 17, that um, they are especially to be held of honor. In other words, they're to be held of honor. And if they teach, they're to be held of special honors. But Earlier on, Paul had said they're all to be able to be teach. It's just a way of emphasizing. It's the same literary device that you, he uses in more than one space. So this is nothing unusual in that sense. But if, if our interpretation of the Savior of all kinds of groups of people is correct, then in chapter 4, verse 10, God has given salvation to all people groups, and it comes through faith. This is affirmed by the mirror additional phrases to come to the knowledge of truth in chapter 2 and those who believe in chapter 4. Verses 1 to 9 appear to strongly suggest Paul is warning Timothy about those who are spreading the Judaizing heresy and as such that the gospel is for the Jews. And in that light, verse 10 would mean all is Jews and Gentiles, which of course it is frequently compared to. Make sense of what appears at first sight to be a strange use of the language. Let's move on to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. On the surface, sounds like a universal offer for salvation. As I said, often these passages, when they're, when they're just taken in their own right, not viewed with the rest of context of Scripture, they could mean that. But reading from verse 1, we see Paul giving a list of different classes and categories of people. And then he says, for showing that all means all kinds. So I think this is important to read in context. In Titus 2.14, and I will just read it here without jumping to it. He who gave himself for us to redeem us from the lawless deed and to purify himself for himself a people for his own possession zealous for good deeds this is very particular language particularist language and it's in the same chapter a few verses down which does not fit a universalist universal application idea in other words really when you are looking at this whole passage you have to come to the conclusion that when Paul is using that word all, he's really referring to Jews and Gentiles. 
And of course, he's using words like, you know, he's using personal pronouns, us, which makes redemption very personal. And he's using words like redeem and purify, which suggest way more than just making people savable. Now let's get to the really difficult passage, or the, the one that Mike st strongly referred to. I think he referred to it in his video several times and probably did in previous videos. I haven't watched them all. Um, and so we're going to look at 1 John 2, 2, because it's an important passage. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Again, read in its own right, I would agree that that sounds like a universal idea. Of course, the problem is, as we saw already earlier, that it, we didn't read it, but I asked you to read it, 1 John 5, 19. You'll see that, that uh, obviously, there's already there a, d a difficult statement that, that seems to indicate otherwise. So Mike claims in this passage that it most certainly includes some non-elect people. That's his, his, his claim. The, Bible, the passage doesn't actually say that. It simply says, for the whole world, and it's up to us to compare Scripture with Scripture to see what he's actually meaning by the whole world. And it's important here that it's, it's the, the term propitiation, as he turned away the wrath of God is only for those who believe in the rest of Scripture. When you particularly read, you go and do a search for propitiation, you will see that it's always referred to with those who believed or to be received by faith. And it's not for the world. Mike says Jesus died for the whole world. He agrees that, of course, not all are justified since we are justified by faith. And likewise, of course, our sins are propitiated for or propitiated by faith. Now, this is an interesting thing because this is one of the passages that Mike frequently falls back on. So we're going to look at again, Romans 3, 20 to 25. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So there's two things here. Crucially important. Mike would need to answer that. And anybody who, who believes in that you, you are not justified until you receive Christ in faith. Which, of course, I would agree with. But of course, here we're told that you're not justified by you're not justified until you're justified through faith. You also receive propitiation through faith. But of course, earlier we saw that propitiation was for the whole world. So you can't have this both ways. This fits much better with the idea that that propitiation, of course, is for Gentiles as well as Jews, and it is accomplished already by Christ for every single person who will receive it. By faith, we appropriate it. By faith, we, sub we subjectively experience it. By faith, we understand that we are justified by God. But Christ has completed it completely. Otherwise, his words, it is finished, are entirely in vain. Further, John, 1 John 1.1 1, 1 says Christ is also an advocate. The context suggests strongly, so this is in the same passage of 1 John 2.2, 2, the context suggests strongly the group he advocates for are also the group he propitiated for, i.e. those who believe, not the whole world. So he is not a propitiation for the whole world. He is only a propitiation for those who believe. So that already limits the atonement. No matter which way you skin this, it, it doesn't work in favor of the universalist unless you only look at the verse in its own right and you do not look at it in light of the context or the rest of Scripture. 
So a particularist interpretation of this passage is actually needed. John chapter 17, verses 9 to 10, Jesus' high priestly prayer shows he is an advocate for those who are his sheep and not for the unsaved world. We saw that already earlier. Strong argument against a universal reading of the whole world without exception in 1 John 2.2. 2. Remember that John, the author of the gospel, is of course the same author of the letter. He's not going to contradict himself in these two places. Now we're going to look at John 11, 51 to 52. Now he did this, sorry, he, he did not say this on his own initiative. This is talking about a prophecy that the high priest gave, and it obviously turns up here in scripture because it was a true prophecy. But being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. That in its own right is a very, very particularist statement in its own right. But it's really interesting that we see a distinct parallel in the language John uses in both of these. And we must bear in mind that he is the same author. Not for ours only is what he says in 1 John 2.2. 2. In John 11, he says not for the nation only. And of course, ours, he probably quite possibly means, of course, because he's writing to possibly a Jewish audience in the church. It's, uh, it's not entirely clear, but it's certainly a similar language construct. Then in 1 John 2.2, 2, he says the whole world. And in John 11 and 52, he says the children of God who are scattered abroad. Obviously, they're scattered abroad across the known world. And you see, again, these two statements are very strongly parallel with each other, which I think it makes a very strong argument, particularly because they come from the same author, that what John had in mind when he writes the whole world, the same thing that he had in mind when he wrote this statement in the Gospel of John. A universal interpretation of whole world in 1 John 2.2 2 causes the author to contradict himself. An interpretation of all without distinction, which is frequently the use of all and world in the Bible, makes perfect sense of both of these statements by the Apostle John. Now we're going to move on. I'm going to sort of pause in the video briefly so I can cut it together. We're going to look at part three, which is a review of the objections raised by Mike. And I think I've already dealt with most of the biblical objections that he's raised. I will still ra raise one or two.